Hi, hey, it is finally time to talk about Luke 14, the parable of the banquet. Um, this video is coming to y'all a lot later than I thought it would, and that's because of a good old thing called executive dysfunction, which is a sort of brain issue that a lot of people who are autistic or who have ADHD or have various mental illnesses and probably a bunch of other stuff, um, it's something that affects us where the part of our brain that sort of manages um, task initiation and completion uh, has some issues. And so for me, the idea of putting this video together, even though it's like my favorite thing in the world to talk about disability theology, and I was so excited to make this video, the part of my brain whose job it was to actually start the video um, and plan what the video would look like just didn't want to get going. So it's been a while, but I finally realized that what was sort of blocking my brain from finally starting this topic is the fact that I planned on trying to keep a, you know, do a short video, keep it under 10 minutes. But meanwhile, I have compiled information that could fill hours and hours of video. Um, I've read so many books and articles and stuff um, and done a lot of thinking and translated the Greek and so much information. How on earth was I gonna, you know, smush it all down into 10 minutes? What I finally decided to do was let go of this idea that I need to keep it really short and concise and instead make a video that's as long as I want it to be first, where I just talk as long as I want without worrying about the time. And then in a little while, I'll make a more compact video for those of you who don't want to sit through 30 minutes of me diving really deep into the passage and you really only are here for the main points of why Luke 14 is important to disability theology. Um, I'll make a video for y'all later, but for now this is for those of you who, like me, love diving into the nitty-gritty details, or who just enjoy watching someone info dump. Um, but I do think if you do stick around and watch this whole thing, you're gonna get, uh, you're, you're really gonna get to know this passage of the Gospel of Luke, and um, learn some very um, important and exciting things about Jesus's message to people with disabilities. So to get started, let's actually, you know, read the passage I'm talking about today. I'll read my own translation because y'all can find other translations online easy. Oh, and to sort of set the background for what's going on in Luke 14, we are actually looking specifically at verses 12 to 24. Um, so the start of Luke 14 is Jesus gets invited to go eat at the house of a Pharisee. So he comes um, and he watches as all the people who are also at this meal with him and this Pharisee host are sort of all fighting to get the best seats at the table. And Jesus says his famous thing about how like, oh, well, you know, when you're invited to sit at a table, you should pick the lowliest seats because then if you're told, oh, hey, you should actually be sitting at a better seat, you'll be like super cool. But if you choose a really good seat and then you're told, actually, you should be sitting a little lower, you're going to be super embarrassed. So Jesus just said that thing. And so I think that introduces the theme of the passage we are going to read, which is this idea that in Jesus's sort of upside down vision for the world um, or the kingdom of God, social norms and the status quo are going to be turned completely on their head. Um, the last will be first and those who are exalted will be humbled and all of that. So now, with that context, let's dive in. A certain man was making a huge supper, and he invited many. He sent out his slave at the hour of the supper to say to the ones invited, Come, for now everything is ready. But they all planned as one to make excuses. The first one said to him, A field have I bought, and I have need to go out to see it. Please have me excused. 
Another one said, Five yokes of oxen have I bought, and I am going out to test them. Please have me excused. The third one said, A woman have I wed, and therefore I am not able to come. So, after returning, the slave reported these things to his master. Then the infuriated head of the household said to his slave, Go out quickly, into the roads and alleys of the city, and lead back here the poor ones, and disabled ones, and blind ones, and impaired ones. And the slave said, Master, it has happened as you commanded, and still there is room. So the master said to the slave, Go out further into the highways and hedges, and make them come, so that my household may be filled to the brim. For I say to you that no one of those men who were invited will taste of my supper. So yeah, that's the passage we're talking about today. But before we dive into it, I want to bring up a different passage of scripture that's related to it. Um, so in case you're not aware, there are four Gospels in the Bible, and a lot of times you'll have a story told in, say, the Gospel of Mark that the Gospel of Matthew also tells, but a little bit differently. Um, and maybe Luke also tells it a little bit differently, but then John doesn't mention it at all. So Luke 14, this um, parable of the banquet, doesn't happen in the Gospel of Mark, doesn't happen in the Gospel of John, but um, people tend to say that, oh, well, it happens in Matthew 22 as well. There's a similar version. This idea of a parable of a big banquet happens in Matthew as well. But the way it's told in Matthew is actually quite different. So different, in fact, that I personally would actually consider them to be different parables because they're telling completely different themes. They have different messages. And so I just wanted to bring up this Matthew version of the parable just for fun for me um, to say it actually feels very different to me. And I think if we look at the differences, it helps us figure out a little bit more about what Luke 14 is saying. So in Matthew 22, again, we have this idea of a host um, telling his slave, his servant, to go out and get all these people to come to his party. Um, but a couple little differences off the bat. In Matthew's version, this host is explicitly said to be a king, and the banquet he's preparing is a wedding feast for his son. And then things start getting really different once the servant goes around to invite everyone to the party. Uh, first of all, the king sends out multiple slaves or servants, and they um, some of them get murdered. Um, so the people who were invited up and kill um, the servants. So that's very different. Um, and so is the fact that the king, in response to this murder, sends out armies to go and kill the people who were invited, who killed his servants. And then it gets even weirder, believe it or not, once the party has begun. The king tells the slave, like in Luke, he says, okay, then just go out into the streets and gather up whoever you can find to come to my party. Um, a key difference for us is that in Matthew, the fact that these people are disabled or poor is not explicitly stated. It's just said, oh, they're just people in the street. That could be anyone. They could be poor, they could have disabilities, or they could be middle class, wealthy, abled. We don't know um, in the book of Matthew. Um, but yeah, once they all get to the party, the king's walking around saying hi to everyone. And oh my gosh, he notices that somebody didn't show up in the proper wedding garment. Um, he's not dressed to code. And the host gets really, really angry about this, um, asks the guy why the heck he's dressed so poorly, and the guy is speechless. He says nothing. Um, so the king has him tied up and thrown out into the streets where there will be gnashing of teeth. Um, so yeah, gets very over the top, very fast. The host in Matthew 22 is very, um, he seems a little bit arbitrary, a bit capricious. He's like, oh yes, everyone should come in. Oh, but if you're not dressed right, get, get out of here. To, so to me, in this parable in Matthew, um, people assume that, oh, the king who's holding this banquet must be God, right? Um, the king is God and the, the banquet, this wedding feast is God's um, kingdom, is heaven, and the son is probably Jesus and so on. Um, I disagree and actually my pastor at my church, she did a sermon on this last year and she's the one who brought this idea to me that, you know, there's no need to believe or assume that the king in Matthew 22 is God. 
um, because God is not a capricious, sort of controlling, violent person. And that doesn't fit the host that we see in Luke 14 at all. Um, so what my pastor suggested, she said that in Matthew 22, this king isn't God. Instead, um, the character who's most godly might be the person who showed up in the wrong wedding attire. Um, that just like the king um, yells at this person and this person doesn't reply and so he gets tied up and thrown out will be a parallel in a few chapters later on in Matthew, in, in the Gospel of Matthew, we have Jesus getting yelled at by Pilate. Pilate at, like demands to know some things of Jesus and Jesus remains silent. And so Pilate, you know, has him arrested and sentenced to death. Um, so yeah, in Matthew, we don't have to see this host as God. Meanwhile, in Luke 14, we have a very different story. We don't have any of this random violence um, or the host blowing up and yelling at the people who do come. Instead, we have a host, a host who seems to be very generous and happy um, just to have his house filled um, with the people that he um, has the servant gather up. And I would assume since, you know, they're poor and they're beggars, they're probably not coming super well dressed. There's none of that, that strange anger. So yeah, I just wanted to bring this up because I think it's fun to reimagine parables um, with different characters representing different people. Um, we don't always have to assume that the main character in a parable is God or Jesus. Sometimes um, it's a, a human, like in Matthew 22, that's a very human king who's being sort of um, capricious and violent and unforgiving. Um, meanwhile, in Luke 14, supposedly the same parable but a different version but in my opinion a quite different parable in luke 14 i do read um the host of this banquet as being god and so do all the interpreters that i looked at all the all the scholars i read and stuff also agree that this host is god um who's holding this party but i do think there are limits to a parable um so once we dive into what this parable is saying first let's get a little more context that will help us understand this parable um, in Luke 14. Uh, the first thing to say is, um, what is a banquet in the, time of, in the time and culture of Jesus? From some of the scholars I read, I learned that um, in Jesus's time and place, remember he is a Palestinian Jew, so he's living in a Jewish society um, with its own history and culture, but it's heavily influenced by Hellenism, by Greco-Roman culture, because they are currently being occupied um, by the Roman Empire. And so the culture of Rome is also seeping into Jesus's life. And so we can look at what um, the Jewish community back then would have thought of about banquets and what the Greco-Roman idea of banquets was. So I found less about Jewish banquets in one book I read called Unexpected Guests at God's Banquet. Um, the author says that Jesus's idea of the banquet um, is borrowed from his Jewish heritage, that this metaphor of the banqueting table would be used um, as sort of a vision of a messianic banquet in which God is the host and all the prophets are guests. And so the banquet um, was and is a reflection of God's cosmos. Um, what I found more info on was the idea of a Greco-Roman banquet. My favorite thing I read was by Louise, Louise Gosbel. I might be saying her name wrong, Gosbell. Oh, a link. You'll you'll see how to spell it. Um, who, in her article reconsidering the parable of the banquet, um, says she brings up the idea of the symposium in Greco-Roman culture. So the first thing she mentions, and a lot of other people I read mention, is that. A banquet was the place where social bonds are strengthened, and so it's a big, big violation of friendship to turn down an invitation without a really good excuse. And she also um, sees that, that bit in the first half of Luke 14, where all the people invited to the party Jesus is at are sort of vying for the best place at the table. She... Um, she draws some information from some Greco Greek and Roman texts about that being a thing that kind of would get out of hand at a symposium um, at one of these Greek or Roman banquets. She says that associated with the kind of table that would be used at a symposium, which would be a table that is pie-shaped, aka the Greek letter pie, 
Um, it was called the triclinium and associated with it was a ranking system um, so that each position was assigned a place and each person present knew their rank and position in relation to each of the guests who were present. Plutarch in Table Talk um, shares a little story about how whenever an especially distinguished guest arrived late and discovered that no place worthy of honor remained at the table, he was insulted and left angrily. So yeah, this idea of finding the right seat that fits the honor you deserve based on your social status was a big deal um, in this time and place. Um, so it makes sense that the people at this party Jesus is at are sort of vying for the best place at the table. They want their fellow human beings to recognize how cool they are and how important they are in society. Whereas Jesus is sort of nudging them like, hey, maybe your status in the eyes of society is not what's important. In fact, maybe it's the people that we as a society tend to think of as having no honor, no place at the table. Maybe it's those people who really deserve the places of honor um, once everything's turned on its head in the kingdom of God. Another really interesting and kind of really quite disturbing thing about these Greco-Roman symposia um, would be that people with disabilities would be put on display um, at these banquets. And there, I don't know that there's any evidence that a Greco-Roman influenced banquet in Jesus's region would mimic this thing that was happening in Rome. Um, but it still is sort of in the culture, this idea that people with disabilities can be gawked at, that they are a spectacle or they should be there to entertain you. And so instead of having a place at the table, being there as guests, if there was anyone with a disability present at a symposium, a banquet, it's probably to be mocked and um, to make jokes for the entertainment of the people. And so we see a reversal happening in this parable in Luke, um, where instead of being um, there um, as objects to be laughed at or people to provide entertainment for the actual guests, instead we see the people with disabilities as being the guests, the ones invited and welcomed in and desperately desired um, at this banquet. So that's pretty cool. Alrighty, now that we have some of that cultural context under our belts, let's talk about the most common interpretations of this parable. Um, when people who read it are trying to figure out what the point of the parable is, the most popular interpretation is that, so those three guys that got invited and made excuses and said, mm, no thanks, I'm not coming, those three men are usually interpreted as standing in for the Jewish community who were God's original chosen people but said no to Jesus and so they're not invited anymore. Meanwhile, the poor and disabled people who are then invited and um, brought into the party are, of course, the Gentiles, those non-Jewish people who eventually say yes to Jesus. Now they're welcome in. They're the new partiers. Um, there's a lot of issues with this interpretation. Humongous anti-Semitism alert, for one thing, because when we say, oh, so Jewish people were the original ones invited, but they all said no because they're so, they just are so silly. They didn't know what they were missing out on or whatever. That's obviously, that's anti-Semitic. They are practitioners of a, a rich and vital faith um, in its own right. Um, and there's this, this implication that God's covenant with the Jewish people has been retracted, right? God's invitation to the Jewish people to participate in community with God um, is now retracted, which is not true. They still have a covenant with God. They still have a community with God. Um, God still has this sort of special relationship with the Jewish people. Um, so it's important to remember that when we're interpreting our parables in our Christian texts. Another really big issue with assuming that we, the Christians, are the ones who um, were outcast and are now invited in, is that, one, a lot of times in our present day, Christians are not the outsiders. We're not the disenfranchised outcasts. Um, we're often, and for instance, in the United States where I live, we are the ones with a lot of privilege. And so just kind of reading the parable and being like, oh yes, of course we're the poor, um, excluded people. Oh man, we're always so persecuted, but God loves us. It's just, it's inaccurate and it sort of feeds this persecution complex 
that lead us to assume that we can never be the ones who have the power and are abusing power and stuff. So that's messed up. Um, it also, if we interpret this parable in this way, um, as Louise Gosbill says, she says that um, the interpretation of the three dudes who say no being the Jewish community and all the poorer people being invited in are the new Gentile Christian community. Um, she says that this interpretation negates any further obligation to seek out those who are still truly marginalized within our own communities. So basically, if you read this um, parable as being like, oh yeah, so all this stuff happened in the past. We are the ones who were invited in and we're living into that right now. Um, it doesn't give us anything to live into, um, anything to strive for in the present. And the whole point of a parable is that it should challenge the listeners. It should have challenged the ones who were listening to Jesus as he spoke on that day. And it should challenge us now today, probably in a, in a different way, right? But there should be a lesson that we can draw from this parable too, a challenge for us as well. And so instead of assuming that we are the outcast ones, the disabled and poor people, um, we might reinterpret, you know, we might explore this parable through different lenses. We might say, okay, well, what, what might it mean if I, instead of being the one who was then invited in and said yes and came and partied, what if I'm one of the three original people who got invited and I just make an excuse and say I don't have the time. Um, what does the parable challenge me to do then? Or what if I am the servant whom God calls to go out and invite all these outcasts and people that I might think aren't really worthy to be dining at this banquet, um, but God's telling me you got to go out there and gather them in. What is the challenge in the parable for me then? So say we do say, okay, well, what if I do this time around want to read the parable in the lens of I am the person who is poor or disabled who is being invited in. What does that challenge us? You know, how does that challenge us too? If those Christians who are abled and reading this text or who are not poor and are reading this text are being asked to imagine themselves in the shoes of people with disabilities and people who are completely impoverished, should that humanize such people you know, in a, those people who are not just metaphorically poor, but are actually, you know, poor in our own societies, um, we should be compelled to humanize them, right? If we're supposed to be in their shoes um, and we should reach out to them. They are our kin. They are our community. Yeah, um, that's some stuff about interpreting the parable that I think is important food for thought. And I mentioned before that when we talk about parables, there's always limitations to them. One is that uh, when Jesus originally told the parable, it was to a very different audience from the, from the audience that listens to the parable today. And so there's always this sort of challenge of how do we balance the, the idea of like what part's metaphor and which part is literally true. It's hard to, it's always hard to wrestle that out. One thing I would challenge when you're listening to this parable is the idea that um, in the kingdom of God, things are exactly like this parable where a host has some people who were invited first and then a bunch of other people who are not afterthoughts or second thoughts but sort of he's des he's just desperate to fill his table he's just desperate to ha get this party um, really going so then he's like oh yes 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 of course bring in all these people um, who were not originally invited it it's good when we're sort of reimagining the parable and really like um, letting it dwell within us and we're really chewing on this parable. It's cool to sort of think, well, is the kingdom of God like that? Where some people were invited first and then some are more like sort of just desperate afterthoughts or maybe everyone's sort of invited first, but different people hear the call different ways. Um, or some people assume that they're not among the ones invited um, and then it turns out they actually are invited too. Um, so they're not responding until um, this servant of God goes directly to them and says, hey, yes, you too. You're one of the people invited to this banquet. Um, sorry that wasn't clear at first, but get, come on in. Again, I have that author who has a cool point of view for um, this idea of reimagining the parable, thinking of it in terms of what the original audience would hear. So I'm just going to read her quote directly because... She says it better than I can paraphrase. 
As Jesus watched the leaders posture for places at the table, he shared the parable of the great banquet. The audience are those who are prestigious and powerful. Jesus knows this and masterfully tells this story in a way that they are able to follow to the end. He begins with their assumption that the noble and powerful will first be invited. All they had to do was look around the room and congratulate one another on making the cut. Jesus continues to unfold the parable, revealing it was not they who will sit in places of honor at the banquet of the king, but those who were crippled, lame, and blind. The message is clear. The roles have been reversed. So, yeah, instead of reading this parable as sort of a a literal, like, you can translate it directly and literally into what the kingdom of heaven will be like, um, with this idea of, oh yes, these people were first and then these people were invited second. Instead, it's, um, you can imagine it as Jesus telling the parable in a way that will fit um, his original audience's expectations and be able to shock them a bit, you know, really turn their expectations on their head, uh, startle them and sort of challenge them to think in a new way, um, which I think is pretty cool and makes more sense to me because, you know, throughout scripture, we see a God who doesn't invite the outcasts of the world as an afterthought, but often instead goes to those outcasts first um, and makes them the recipients of divine blessing and the agents of divine blessing. Um, They're not an afterthought, these outcasts. Um, In most of scripture, they are the ones who are first. The ones that the world calls last are the ones that God calls first. Okay, so we've been talking for a while now, and we haven't even really talked about the key takeaways for this parable. Um, So we've got context for the parable, different ways of interpreting the parable. Let's talk about what Jesus was really trying to say with the parable. So if you're looking at this parable through a disability theology lens, the most obvious message that we see in this passage in Luke um, is the very exciting idea that People with disabilities are welcome in the kingdom of God, just as they are. There's nothing in this parable about the um, people with disabilities having to get fixed or cured or healed or however you want to say it. They don't have to assimilate to abled norms in order to be at this banquet. They come just as they are. And to mention that the, the different version of this parable back in Matthew 22, like I said before, if we remember in Matthew 22, Um, at that human banquet where a human king um, yells at a dude for being dressed wrong, that's sort of the opposite idea to me, right? And this human king is saying, you have to look just right. You have to look like you belong here or you're getting tied up and kicked out. Meanwhile, in this Luke 14 banquet uh, where we can interpret God as being the host, um, there's that idea is not here. You don't have to look a certain way or act a certain way or be a certain way in order to be welcome at the table. God is just happy and delighted to have you there. People with disabilities are welcome um, in the community of God, just as they are. I've talked about that already in two other videos, but it is such, such a key point. In the book, The Enabled Life, which is by Roy McClowry, it's really good. Um, he describes this idea in this way. They come as they are. They do not have to be healed in order to be the honored guests. This is a picture of disabled people, not as weak and helpless, but as preferable to those who claim to be too important to turn up. The world of ambition and self-importance is subverted by the world of apparent weakness. This passage is a shot across the bows for those who believe that the ultimate expression of the kingdom of God in the new world will be composed of the normal or even successful people. God's preference may be so much more radical than that. The other really, really, really key takeaway for this parable is that this banquet image should be something that we strive for in the here and now. It's not just something to look forward to in heaven in the future. We need to um, take this idea that we see in this parable where people with disabilities, people who are poor, people who are outcast in our society, aren't just allowed to come in and sit at the table, but get a place of honor at the table, um, are really, really, really desired um, at our table. Um, That's something we need now.
we are called by God to do whatever we can to make this parable true in our own communities today, instead of just saying, oh, hey, look, this will be nice in the future. Um, so that gives me some really big questions to ask. One of the big ones, um, and it's going to help us sort of dig into some of the characters in this parable, the big question is, if our own banquet tables, our own faith communities don't look like God's banquet table, can we claim to represent the kingdom of God on earth? Um, can we claim to be carrying out God's will? How can the church claim that um, if we don't even look like the kingdom of God as described in the gospels? If instead of making room and really wanting people with disabilities to be in our communities, we instead keep them out by having inaccessible spaces that they can't physically get into or stay in, um, or we just make things sort of, you know, we leave them in, in a corner, we leave them in the back, um, and we never invite them to share their gifts. Can we really claim to be living into the kingdom of God? Um, and another big question is, if people that we think are beneath us somehow are the ones who will join us at the banquet table and perhaps even get better spots at the table than we do, will we still say yes to God's invitation? Or are we truly supposed to see ourselves in the three men who make excuses and say they can't come? So with that question in mind, let's really dig into what's going on in the first half of this parable where we have these um, three guys who got invited and make excuses not to come. Um, so the first thing to know, when the story says that, um, you know, the, the banquet is ready and the master says to his slave, all right, go and tell everyone um, to come, call them in. We should know that culturally, these people would have been invited previously. Um, these guys who make excuses and say they can't come aren't doing so because they're being put on the spot. They knew the party was coming. What would have happened is, um, I don't know the exact time frame, but let's say a week before the party, um, this host has already sent out invitations and these men have said, yeah, I'll be there. Um, and then the day of comes and they that's when they make the excuse. Uh, actually, I'm not gonna be there. And like I mentioned before, that is a huge, huge violation of friendship and trust. It's a big no-no. They are, they're really dishonoring the host by turning down an invitation that they had originally said yes to. So I just, I was really curious about what made them say yes, and then when the day actually comes, say no. My common English Bible has footnotes, and the footnote it has for these verses is to say that these guys are making phony excuses, that um, this idea that, oh, I just bought a field and I have to go check it out. Um, oh, I just bought some oxen and I have to go test them out. According to this footnote, um, that's not something you'd have to do. Like, you wouldn't have bought the land without already having checked it out. You wouldn't have bought these oxen without already having tested them. So it sounds, uh, basically the, whoever wrote this footnote is like, sounds fake, but okay. Um, and same with the guy who just got married. He wouldn't have said yes to the invitation if he knew he was going to get married on that day. Um, that same CEB Common English Bible footnote suggests that maybe the host has lost status um, in between the time that he sent the original invitation and the day of when he says, oh guys, it's time, it's ready. Maybe he lost some status and they don't want to come anymore. So yeah, what could, what could it be that makes them wary to come? Uh, another article I read um, has this idea, this, prop, this proposal that, um, so this guy named Palmer says that, that the excuses these guys make are the same situations permitted by law in order to be absented from active military service. So basically, these guys are making the same kind of excuses they would make in order to get out of military service. Um, so to Palmer, there is a stinging jibe at the host and the excuses of the invited guests. To plead an excuse that would exempt you from battle implies that the catering is more exciting than reliable. Um, so 
this idea that they don't want to come because there's something about this host and the way he ha holds ba banquets that seems kind of wild or dangerous even to them. And I'm really, I'm, I don't know if I agree with Palmer exactly, but I'm very intrigued by this idea that suddenly this banquet is too dangerous for these guys to attend. Maybe somehow they know that the host plans on inviting other people to the party that are disabled, that are impoverished, that are completely beneath them socially. Maybe they somehow know that that's this host's plan all along. Maybe it's not sort of an afterthought or an act of desperation, but something they know he's planning to do. One of the parts in the Greek of this passage that I think um, supports this idea is in verse 18, um, the way the, the English is usually translated is just like, but they all alike made excuses or whatever. They all alike began to make excuses. Whereas if you look in the Greek, there's a verb that's there that's not usually translated. It's literally something like, but they all ruled as one to make excuses. To me, this idea makes me think that maybe before the day of the banquet, they all gathered together to talk and sort of gossip among each other and be like, did you say yes to going to that party? Yeah, yeah, I did. I did say yes to going to that party, but I really don't want to go um, now that um, something has happened, right? That this host is no longer someone we want to associate with. And so they all agree as one. They, they plan together and they rule as one to make excuses. They all join together to come up with different excuses so that they don't have to come even though they originally said yes. And so there's this idea that this party is going to be dangerous to their social status because if they are seen at this party where there's a bunch of poor people, oof, there goes their status. So they don't want to come anymore, especially if they can't even be guaranteed to be given a place of honor that's higher up than these poor people's place at the table. So that's sort of my thought on why they made these excuses. Tell me what you think. But yeah, I think it's definitely open to interpretation. But I think when we imagine things this way, um, it can sort of challenge us to say, again, to ask that question again, if we knew a certain person or group of people was going to be in heaven, was going to be at the table of God, would, like what group or person would be there that would make us say, actually, I'm going to have to decline this one. Okay, so now we've dug a little bit into the possible motives of these excuse makers. Now let's talk about who the master's slave might be and who exactly these poor and disabled people are. A good number of the interpreters I saw are saying that this servant of the master represents Jesus, but others, and I tend to lean more towards them, are saying that actually the servant represents um, us. Not always. Again, I think it's great to read through a parable um, in several different ways and imagine yourself in the shoes of different characters in it. Um, but one of the big ways for me with this parable is to imagine myself in the shoes of the servant or slave who's running around inviting all these people. Um, because when we think about how to enact this parable in our own lives, I would be playing the role of the servant who's running around trying to get these people to come in to the banquet. Um, who's saying, hey, yes, you're invited. Yes, you. You possibly have felt like you've been excluded before because we weren't doing it right. There were things that were making you not welcome at the table. Well, I'm here. God has sent me to tell you that there is room for you at this table and we need you here. We want you here. And speaking of that idea of we really want and need um, these outcasts to be at the banquet. That brings me to one last word study. Don't worry. I'm only going to make you look at the Greek one more time. In uh, verse 22 of Luke 14, it says that um, the way I translated it is go out into the highways and the hedges and make them come. Um, but the verb make is a lot more forceful. It's more like go out and force them to come, compel them to come, um, or just urge them to come. It's this pretty strong verb um, in most of its uses in the Bible, which is really interesting because this idea of compulsion, of sort of forcing people to participate in God's communities is not present in many places in the Bible. 
in the New Testament, there's only two examples of this kind of forcefulness. Um, here in Luke 14, 23, um, there's this command of compelling people to come in. And then in Mark 6, 45, and it's parallel, Matthew 14, 22, um, Jesus forces his disciples to get on a boat and leave the crowds. Um, those are sort of the only times when this idea of forcing someone to do something um, happens in this way in the Bible. So I think it's kind of interesting that it occurs here. And to me, it is this idea that this host is truly desperate for these people to come in. He's, he's basically telling his servant, go out there and tell them to come and do not take no for an answer. I don't I don't think that this servant is literally going to like force people to come if they really don't want to, but he is supposed to sort of to do whatever he has to do to get them to come to this party because the host so desperately wants his banquet to be a really lively one, to be full of people. And um, I think when we look at what that means for us today in our own communities, it shows how important it is for us to reach out to the outcasts of society, especially those who are homeless, who are poor, who are disabled, and say, we really need you here. We cannot have this party without you, which I think is so different from how we usually view people with disabilities. Um, normally, we just kind of let them be there. Um, and we see how we can help them without thinking about the many ways that they can, they can help us, they can participate, how they are vital um, to what it means to live into God's kingdom. And yeah, so I'll give a few more passages from the book Unexpected Guests at God's Banquet that really drives this idea home that um, the table in this parable is big enough for all who, in, who were invited to sit at it and enjoy the meal. There is no sense that the table was overly crowded with the need to move over to make an extra place for another person. In fact, there was so much space left over that the servant was sent out a second time to bring in more people. This is an important point. If the banquet table is a metaphor for the kingdom of God, then people with disabilities have a place that already exists at the table. People with disabling conditions are not to be kept out of congregational life. They are to be warmly received. So when we compare that to how those um, first people invited, those guys who made excuses and said they couldn't come, um, turned down the invitation, another sort of suggestion for why they said no is that they didn't realize that this was the most important thing they could be doing. They're so busy, you know, they want to go work. They want to check out their oxen and their fields and their wife. Um, but that's not the most important thing they could be doing right at that moment. The most important thing they could do, says this book, um, is to enjoy a meal together. They did not understand that God extended the invitation because God enjoyed who they are, not because of what they do or what they own. In the life of the church, merely being in the presence of God may be truly threatening for some members of the banquet feast on earth. But this may be the prophetic message, the prophetic stance of many people with disabling conditions that renders the rest of us silent. This may be the correct position before the presence of God, merely being ourselves. Ultimately, God values human creation not because of what human beings can do, but because they are created in the image of God, the Imago Dei. <sighs> this has gotten long, and I'm kind of tired of talking, and there's still a lot more that I want to talk about, but I think I'll make it a separate video. Most of it is about um, just digging in even more to what vision of the kingdom of God we get in this passage and in some other passages of the Bible, um, and to talk about a really cool idea um, that I read about, about how instead of erasing disabilities in heaven, they will be redeemed instead. There will be a redemption of disability. For now, I'm just gonna close with a poem that I wrote, so, uh, I think a year ago, that was sort of inspired by this parable of the banquet. I wrote it at that time when, you know, the whole straw ban thing was going on, where it suddenly was really popular to get rid of plastic straws. And a lot of people in the disability community spoke out against that, saying, uh, first of all, 
plastic straws are not the biggest waste issue we have. And second of all, a lot of people with disabilities need straws to survive. That's the only way they can take in sustenance. And so could you maybe not stop providing them with ways to survive? But yeah, so this is my poem called Unity. There will be straws at that banquet, and all the bread will be gluten-free, and no one will go away hungry because there was no food that fit their dietary needs, and the table will be high enough for wheelchairs to slide easily beneath it, and no one will gawk at those of us who have trouble sitting still so long and stand instead and stomp our feet, and no one will grab our flapping wrists and hiss, quiet hands, God, I cannot wait to never hear that hateful phrase again. And Jesus, there you will be, not at the head of the table, but in the middle of things, breaking bread with hands that struggle a little, impeded by the damage done to your fine motor skills when the nails pierced your wrists, and with a wheelchair stationed behind you that friends can push you in when the chronic pain in your nail-damaged feet becomes too much. And we will all share in the lopsided chunks of gluten-free bread that is your body, or the cups of juice with straws that is your blood. And there will be laughter. Oh, there will be laughter, loud and carefree, communicated through AAC, or sign language, or smiling mouths, as we finally learn what it means to be truly one, united, not in spite of, but through diversity. <laughs>